Okay, welcome to the, uh, the session, The Geodynamics of Plate Tectonics. Um, we've got an interesting lineup of speakers today, and um, we're going to be uh, having this lineup in this session and in the coming, the later afternoon session. And then we also have a poster session tomorrow afternoon, which I encourage you to visit. Okay. Um, let's see. Our first speaker is Patrice Ray, uh, Nicholas Coltis, and Nicholas Flament. Continental Buoyancy and the Initiation of Plate Tectonics on the Early Earth. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, before to move into the uh, realm of geodynamics, I would like to start uh, with something I know perhaps a little bit better, um, uh, starting with uh, a simple tectonic uh, experiment. Uh, what, uh, do we have a, a laser? How does it work? Yep. Uh, let's consider um, an orogenic plateau, uh, 60, 65 kilometers uh, thick, adjacent to a foreland crust, uh, 35, 40 kilometers thick, um, viscoplastic uh, rheology, and we are going to assume that uh, that orogenic uh, plateau uh, is uh, warm. Uh, so we have, we have a temperature of the Moho here at about 11. Uh, Kelvin. And we are interested to know uh, what would happen to that plateau uh, if we uh, let it uh, evolve. Uh, uh, and uh, this picture here shows the plateau at about 12 million years uh, after uh, uh, letting uh, the experiment go. Uh, and and what, what happened here is basically the, the plateau disappeared. We have uh, this huge uh, lateral uh, uh, transfer of mass from the plateau into the foreland, and, and the foreland become thicker as it is shortened under the push uh, of the plateau. Uh, there is a number of processes that, that occur. We have a fantastic channel flow here in the, in the lower crust. We have a metamorphic core complex here that develop uh, at the plateau margin. We have some lateral extrusion of uh, the plateau crust into the foreland, and we have also shortening of the foreland here and the activation of uh, reverse fault here. The point here of that experiment is uh, to show that buoyancy forces that are related to lateral gradient in potential energy on their own can drive a lithospheric deformation. The physics of that process is relatively easy. What drives the deformation is just the gravitational force, which is something which is easily uh, to calculate. It corresponds to the difference in the vertical integration of the lithostatic uh, profile along uh, the uh, plateau colon and, uh, and the foreland colon. I want to use this concept to see if we can use it to uh, revisit the, uh, the problem of uh, mental convection. In particular, I'm interested to know if we can use that concept to explain a switch from a stagnant lead uh, convective regime to a mobile lead uh, convective regime. Usually, this is discussed in terms of a stress balance between the convective stress and the yield stress of the lead. If the convective stress is stronger than the yield stress of the lead, the lead is going to be part of the convective system. And of course, if, uh, if the convective stress does not overcome the yield stress, then that lead here is, is stable. So here, the strength of the lead is, uh, is, is the key. One way uh, to, to, uh, to weaken the, the, the lead is to introduce uh, uh, some sort of weakening, localized weakening, um, or there is a smarter way to do it, like, uh, for instance, you know, increasing the surface temperature. This is coming from a, a paper from Nardik, Jelinek, and Morris in 2008, uh, showing in this uh, plate tectonic phase diagram here, in which we report the critical, they report here the critical surface temperature here in that axis, and here the yield stress uh, of the lead. If we consider yield stress of 35 megapascal, uh, you just have to rise the temperature at the surface of the Earth to 60 degrees to move from a plate tectonic regime into a stagnant league uh, uh, regime. The interesting part of that theory here is that if you consider a yield stress of 40 megapascal, well, present day global warming uh, is enough to shut down uh, plate tectonics. 
The question I want to uh, address here is in the Archean, could volume force associated with an heterogeneous lead, uh, heterogeneous here is chemically heterogeneous lead, have forced a switch from a stagnant lead to a mobile lead uh, regime? Uh, and I'm consider uh, that, the, that, that situation here. Uh, I'm going to consider that uh, we have an oceanic plateau uh, that uh, develop, uh, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm interested to know if that oceanic plateau here is enough to move from a stagnant lead regime here to a, mo uh, a regime in which we drive a kind of plate tectonic process. The rationale for that is relatively simple. Let's consider an oceanic plateau uh, here uh, standing uh, on, uh, on a convective mantle. That plateau here, the total thickness is 175 kilometers. It is made of 120 kilometers thick depleted mantle with a density 3310 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, that depletion here has produced, you know, there was 30, 40 percent melt here, and this melt has produced the oceanic plateau here which is made of, uh, in, in red here, some sort of mafi granulites. Uh, that oceanic plateau, you know, uh, differentiates uh, itself, in particular with a lot of production of TTG. And uh, above here, we have a typical greenstone uh, cover, uh, which has been weathered, you know, under uh, you know, ocean, oceanic conditions. If you calculate the gravitational force that corresponds simply to the integration with depth of uh, uh, the difference in electrostatic pressure between the oceanic plateau here and, and the lead, uh, you get this. So you integrate that, that surface here. The surface you know, under this curve is the, give you the value of the gravitational force here. This is in tera Newton per meter. And if you consider, for instance, a 200 kilometers oceanic uh, uh, plateau, you end up with a gravitational force, an horizontal gravitational force of 25 tera newton. If you divide that by 200 kilometers, you have a, a stress, uh, a gravitational stress of 125 megapascal. This is, you know, tectonic uh, uh, stress. So we expect that this will uh, impose a very significant stress uh, on the lead. If we want to test further, we need to move uh, into uh, modeling. So here I'm going to use uh, a code which is called ellipsis that allows us to do some couple thermomechanical modeling. And I'm going to consider uh, a model which is uh, 4,200 kilometers long, 700 kilometers uh, deep. I want to have a good resolution here in the upper part of the system, so I'm going to limit myself to the, to the convection, convection in the upper mantle. Uh, this is the density of the, of the mantle. This is the coefficient of thermal expansion. I have a heat production inside. I have a basal temperature and a constant surface temperature. Critical to that uh, uh, modeling, of course, is the rheology. So the rheology for the convective mantle is your standard plastic viscous uh, rheology. Uh, um, uh, for the viscous part, I'm using a dry olivine uh, rheology. Uh, for the plastic part, I have a, a Bayerly a low type uh, uh, branch here that corresponds to, uh, to that low here, and I have a, a pseudoplastic um, uh, uh, low here uh, that, that fixed at 350 uh, megapascal. Importantly, this plastic deformation and pseudoplastic deformation is, uh, um, uh, has the ability to weaken, and uh, the weakening here is, is really key in this kind of modeling. The, 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 the weakening is such that I'm going to uh, decrease the value of the yield stress by 25 once the accumulated plastic uh, strain, uh, so post-yielding, reach a value of 15%. So a pretty efficient uh, uh, weakening. This is the situation of the model without the oceanic plateau, and there is you know, close to a billion years of evolution here. The Rayleigh number is about 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 7, and you have you know, your classical looking type of uh, convective motion here with cold drips and, uh, and hot plumes here uh, rising from, the, from that boundary here. Now, the case for the oceanic plateau. Before to impose my oceanic plateau, what I'm going to do is to simplify this. I'm going to average, I'm going to take the average temperature here in the convective mantle, and I'm going to linearize the geotherm in the lead. I want to do that because here, I want to start with a system where there is absolutely no uh, convective stress and no uh, lateral uh, uh, contrast in, in gravitational potential energy. So there is no uh, horizontal force here acting uh, on, that, on that system. I'm going to impose uh, an oceanic plateau. 
uh, the depleted mantle here in green uh, is buoyant, is, it, is depleted, so the wall has been removed, the iron has been removed, the aluminum has been removed, it is buoyant, it is dry and strong. Uh, the rheology here is such that that mantle here is 100 times more viscous than the convective uh, mantle. Above, I have a mafic granulite, about 40 kilometers thick, and on top of, of that model here, uh, I have also a 15 kilometer thick layer of a dense but weak uh, material, and I impose this to uh, help uh, uh, the, the subduction process. Uh, note that this, this layer was also introduced in the model where I had no, uh, I had no continent, uh, no uh, oceanic plateau. Here we have the uh, first 100 million years of, uh, of history. Uh, it unfolds in basically two phases. We have a long phase of incubation during which the plateau uh, uh, spread, uh, and to spread, you need to make space for itself, so it squeezed the, the lid on both sides and slowly start to initiate uh, a subduction. Uh, when that slab here reaches about 100 kilometers, it is self-driven, uh, and, and the slab uh, goes down. And uh, we have a nice uh, rifting here of the, of the oceanic plateau. Uh, we have a you know, detachment of the, of the slab here. Nothing much has happened here on that side. Uh, but you know, after another 20 million years, that slab here starts to, to reach the critical depth at which it is self-driven. And we have another, another phase here of, uh, of subduction. Uh, 124 million years, the slab detached, and, and then slowly the system, you know, thermally relax, and, uh, and slowly we, we, we develop uh, a second generation of, uh, of lead. Uh, if you look at the, at the composition here uh, uh, of the, of the uh, subcontinental titus fragmental in Archean Craton, uh, what we observe quite often is the upper part of the, of the plateau is made of depleted uh, Asbergite, but it is, you know, undepleted by more fertile uh, material. And if you look at that section here, this is what also what we have. Uh, as that, you know, uh, as the adjective uh, mental, convective mental get accreted into the, into the lead. So some conclusions and, and remarks. In the Archean, uh, oceanic plateau may have had enough buoyancy to deform the adjacent lead and initiate, initiate its subduction. Plate tectonics uh, crank started by oceanic plateau may have been transient until a time where plant tectonics became uh, self-sustained. Uh, uh, and if we try to compare this uh, to field uh, observation, this process is compatible with the co-occurrence of plume-related and subduction-related basalt in many uh, uh, greenstone cover. Thank you. We have time for maybe one quick question. One or two. Yeah, in the front. Yeah, I mean, we, we can play here with the contrast. Uh, yeah, the, the question is, um, what, what would be the, the contrast in buoyancy between the lead and the plateau to maintain that, that process? So here, the contrast in, in, uh, in buoyancy derived from the density of the, of the lead. Uh, of, the, of, the, of the, you know, uh, Archean, or, the, or the, the, the plateau of the, or the depleted mantle, which uh, uh, is set here at 33.10 kilogram per cubic meter, which I derived from geochemical uh, data and analysis, uh, versus, you know, 33.95, you know, uh, plus the question of thermal expansion. And we can, of course, play with this uh, difference, as well as with the thickness of that depleted mantle. And until now, we can reduce that, you know, to uh, for 3310, we can go down to 3360. So I can, I can basically divide this, this contrast by two. It will take longer to initiate the subduction, but eventually it will. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, the next talk is given by Clint Conrad. It's with Bernard Steinberger and Tron Torsvik, and it's past mental dynamics revealed by net characteristics of surface plate motions. And I'm the speaker, so.
Okay, we know that plate tectonics is a time-dependent system that's ultimately driven by convection in the Earth's mantle. And here I have, um, I show some, uh, we're, we're starting to get some, some images of what that, the convection patterns in the mantle look like for the present day. Um, these are some pictures that I've, I've, uh, I've made from a mantle flow field that I was involved in developing. And basically, the, um, the advent of, of seismic tomography has allowed us to use um, seismic tomographic images as a starting point for um, generating mantle flow uh, fields such as this one, because you can infer den mantle density heterogeneity from the tomographic images to drive a flow field. This is um, a, a cross section across Africa and across the Pacific, and here we have this large scale upwelling flow pattern, at least in this model. Um, that seems to rise from this, these large, low, slow velocity provinces um, that are um, observed on the core mantle boundary. Okay, um, that's for the present day. Um, we'd like to know what mantle flow patterns were like in the past, but we don't have tomography from past times. But what we, what we do have from past times is um, plate tectonic reconstructions. And because the plate, tec plate tectonics is ultimately driven by um, man, the mantle flow going on beneath it, then in principle we should be able to learn something about mantle flow from the patterns of plate motions in the past times that we can observe from the tectonic reconstruction. So this is a picture of tectonic re reconstructions from uh, uh, the tectonic reconstruction of Torsvik et al. 2010, and you go back in time, and there's some interesting patterns of um, different shapes and sizes and geometries of of plates and they're moving in different directions that change with time. And um, so they're ultimately driven from pat mantle flow. What can they tell us about the past mantle flow? And to do that, I'm going to um, talk about something that I'm calling the net characteristics of plate tectonics. And I'll describe what that means. First, I'll give um, an example that I won't talk about too much. Is one net characteristic of plate motions is the net rotation of plate motion. So you can describe in a net sense, rotation of the entire lithosphere about a pole of net rotation. It turns out that pole of net rotation is between Antarctica and Australia for the present day, at least for the HS3 um, uh, um, Griffin-Gordon plate motion model. Um, that, uh, the location and the amplitude of the net rotation depend on the re mantle reference frame. I'm going to talk about two, new, uh, two newly described uh, net characteristics of plate motion that don't depend on the mantle reference frame. The first one is what I'm calling the, um, the net dipole. So the net dipole is, um, is a net motion of all plates towards a location, towards a single pole on the Earth, okay? So this is in map view and this is um, in spherical view and you can see all the, all the plates. That would be as if all the plates were moving towards a certain point on the Earth. So where on the Earth right now is the location of the net dipole. And it turns out that the net dipole is loaded right, located right there. It's in the country of North Korea. And um, so on average, the motions of the plates are all moving towards that location in North Korea. And then they're, on average, they're moving away from a point that's near Argentina, OK? So um, and again, this doesn't depend on the net rotation, uh, on the mantle reference frame. So you could do this in no net rotation or some net rotation. It's independent of that, the location of that point. Okay. And this is um, a picture from that same uh, Conrad and Ben uh, uh, mantle flow model, the green arrows. And it's a cross section across, kind of in the middle is where, um, where you go through that net dipole location. And you can see that there's a lot of slabs in the mantle down there, and they're driving a downwelling flow that moves away on the core mantle boundary. And, um, and so that's why you have a net convergence point there on the Earth, is because there's a lot of slabs that are, there's a long history of subduction in this area, and there continues to be subduction. And so the mantle flow is driving the, um, the plates on average towards that location. And um, in fact, if you look, the red arrows here are the basal tractions from our mantle flow model on the base of the lithosphere. And if you look, you can calculate the net dipole location for these basal tractions, and it turns out to be located very close to the plate tectonic uh, 
net dipole. And so what this is telling us is that this location of the net dipole is telling us something about the large scale flow patterns in the deep mantle. Okay, and so we can apply this, we can calculate the net dipole location um, for the plate tectonic reconstructions. And um, Torsvek et al. has one that goes back to 250 million years. Of course, it gets less well constrained as you go back in time. But, um, but uh, what I'm showing here is uh, the colors represent age of the reconstruction. And so as you go from red to yellow to green to blue, you go back in time. Okay? And what you can see is that the net dipole location has not moved very much from this Eastern Asia location that it is now. And so that represents a stability of, of this degree one motion of plate motions um, that basically represents that there's always been subduction in this area uh, beneath, Asia, uh, beneath Eastern Asia and um, uh, when the Tethys was closing and also um, from Pacific subduction. Okay. So that's, um, that's telling you something about the stability of, of subduction and of, of large-scale mantle flow. Okay, now I want to talk about a second, uh, it's kind of a degree two net characteristic, which I'm calling the, the net quadrupole. And this one I think is even more interesting than the dipole. Um, this is, a, a, you can kind of see it here, you have a, you have a net convergence location, which is the plus, and a net divergence location, which is the minus. Okay, and actually the, the divergence occurs on a, on a line that runs through this, um, this null pole, which is in between. So you have three different poles on the Earth, which, um, and each pole has one on the opposite side of the Earth. So you have two divergent locations, uh, sorry, two divergent locations, which are the minuses, two convergent poles, which are the pluses. And they move about these, um, these uh, uh, null poles, which are the Xs. Okay. Where are those locations on the Earth? Turns out there's one in the Western Pacific. That on average, we're move the plates are moving towards the Western Pacific and the, uh, near Brazil and away from points over Africa and the Mid-Pacific. Okay. And again, I can show you the... Um, the basal tractions from the mantle flow model, and these are, you calculate the, um, the quadrupole from these, and the poles are all lined up with the plate tectonic um, uh, quadrupole locations. Okay, so this is indicating that the pattern, the, these large scale patterns of plate motions at the surface are telling us something about the mantle flow patterns at depth. And indeed, this is what you see from the mantle flow pattern. You see near these, um, Convergent poles here, um, you see down, large scale downwelling and then upwelling above these two, um, these two divergent poles. And I'll note that they're above these LLSVP locations, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay, um, now let's look at the time dependence of the quadrupole. So the um, I'm showing here in hatched pink is the locations of the Pacific and African. Uh, LLSVP regions, and um, again in colors, now I'm only going back to 100 million years right now for, um, for these poles, and you can see that neither the, um, the divergent or the convergent quadrupole locations have moved very much with time. They've been re relatively stable. But now we go back in time, and the, um, the convergent, the di the, sorry, the convergent pole has moved to the north and the south Pacific, whereas the divergent poles remain stable. This is kind of Cenozo uh, Cretaceous times. And as we go farther back um, into the early Mesozoic, um, again you see that the divergent poles are in the central or eastern Pacific, above these two LLSVP regions, and the convergent poles have moved um, around, continue to move around the Pacific. So if you look at the full time series, you see that the divergent poles remain relatively stationary above the African and the Pacific LLSVP regions. And um, these, uh, and the convergent poles have drifted all around the Pacific, kind of in a ring around these two uh, relatively stable divergent quadrupole regions, okay? 
Okay, so just to conclude, um, I've calculated the, these two new net characteristics of plate motions for plate tectonic reconstructions. One is the plate tectonic dipole, and that um, reveal, that's relatively stable over Eastern Asia and re reveals a history of steady subduction in the Western Pacific, which is consistent with uh, the tectonic models. Um, the plate tectonic quadrupole, um, the surface tectonics seem to pivot about these two stable upwellings beneath Africa and the Pacific, and they line up with these LLSVP regions on the core mantle boundary. And this is consistent with some other recent studies which have suggested that these LLSVP regions uh, represent a deep mantle anchor structure by jo that was, um, that term was coined by uh, Jawanski et al. Uh, 2010, and also it's been noted by Torsvik and um, Kevin Burke in some other papers uh, that the uh, plumes and, um, and some other, uh, other igneous activity seems to occur, seems to arise from the edges of these LLSVP regions. These are indicating that the LLS, these LLSVP regions um, represent a stability for mantle convection as a whole, and that stability is revealed in the, uh, in the net characteristics of plate tectonics as we can decipher them from uh, the plate tectonic reconstructions. Thanks a lot. And I, I guess we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, Alan. Uh, the question is, have we compared the strength of the dipole or quadrupole? Um, yes, we have. In fact, the strength um, have interesting variations in time, which I didn't have time to talk about, but, um, but they both seem to move together in terms of amplitude. And the amplitude somewhat depends on how you normalize these, um, uh, how, how you calculate the, uh, the the strength of the pole. It depends on the normalization you use, but if you use kind of a comparable normalization, then they're, they're, they're comparable in amplitude. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah? Okay, yeah, right. So um, if I, let's see if I can go back. Yeah, right. All I talked about in this, in this, um, yeah, here. All I talked about in this is the location of the poles, which I think reveal an interesting story. But um, what, what, you, what I also show here is, um, is these arrows, and they have different lengths. And basically, I've defined a basis function which represents that the ampli which represents this quad, like a pure quadrupole, and that's what I'm showing here. So um, it would be the amplitude of the highest of, of the largest arrow there which in this case might be five centimeters or something like that. Okay, yeah. Uh, any other? Yeah. That's an excellent question. Um, I've tried it with um, several other plate tectonic reconstructions, or a few other, like uh, the Lithgow Bertoloni and Richards, 1998, and you see, um, you see the same poles in basically the same locations. I also tried it with the tectonic reconstruction that's on G-plates, and, um, and that also shows a very similar, similar pattern. You see more of a difference in the convergent poles, the locations of the convergent poles. These, these ones, are, yeah, these ones, they move. That's a little bit more sensitive to the details of how, um, how subductions, um, or, or it, it's a little bit more sensitive. Those are sensitive to uh, the tectonic reconstruction, but what's very consistent is the location of these divergent poles. Okay, thanks a lot. So I'm Fabio Capitano, I'm your co-convener. I'm a bit late due to a conflict. Our next speaker is Adrian Lenardic, presenting a talk on titled The Whole Earth Effect of Pangea Assembly and Dispersal. Uh, you can either use the
it's not for that. But let me get it up first. Here it is. So this regular one there would work. You can use this or or that. Okay, you know, it'll it'll go red at 13 minutes. So the yellow. Okay. Here's the one. Thanks. I want to get us thinking about some of the changes that happened to the Earth during the Cretaceous. Uh, in particular, there are changes in climate, the Cretaceous greenhouse world preceded by cooler conditions, inferences of sea level changes. There's a prolonged period where the Earth's magnetic pole does not go through a polarity flip, the Cretaceous supercron. Within that, there is a burst in large igneous province activity. That's the lips defined by the volume of basalt when placed on the surface of the Earth. There's also a change in the nature of continental arcs. Um, all through this, this is a time when Pangaea, the last supercontinent Earth experienced, is breaking up. What we want to do is explore the potential connections between all of these. Um, by no means are we the first to consider this, and if you're patient, you will see we're not the only ones in this room to consider it. And that's okay. It's an interesting problem. Different perspective is good in that sense. In terms of perspective, in developing a scaling theory to address the effects of continents on mantle convection, which is going to be key to the arguments I'm going to make, we made a bit of a break from what I'll call the party line. So I want to talk to you a bit about that, at least conceptually, before I compare model predictions to observations. So the idea of continental insulation is fairly straightforward in principle. Uh, continents being thicker, continental lithosphere in particular, provide a longer thermal path for heat escaping from the Earth. That is, they have a higher thermal resistance than the oceanic lithosphere. This potentially makes them insulating. The going idea has been that this becomes very pronounced during times of supercontinental assembly. In developing our scaling theory, we made a break from that. We said, no, um, continents are insulating all the time. Most of the time, however, that insulation does not lead to any localized thermal anomalies below the continents themselves, and the reason for that is efficient lateral mixing due to mantle convection below the subcontinental mantle domain and the oceanic domain. What that means is you can also have periods where a supercontinent is assembled and you have no thermal anomaly developing below it at all. And originally, we wanted to develop these scalings to uh, explain some discrepancies between different modeling groups. But it also leads to this specific prediction. If you're going to get a thermal anomaly below a supercontinent, what you need to do is cut off that lateral mixing. One way to do it, which I've shown in a cartoon form here, is to have subduction curtains around the supercontinent. The other way that's predicted in theory is to have the supercontinent become fixed relative to the mantle flow pattern. I want to state this again using here a numerical cartoon or numerical simulation if you prefer. This is a simulation of convection, uh, the blue cold downwelling, the red warm upwelling. There is a continental lid in place that is thicker, it has a higher thermal resistance than the bulk mantle, it is insulating. If we look at the mid-mantle temperature at mid-depth, the sort of a long profile here, this is the actual one. You'll see variations. There are little spikes due to upflows and downflows, in particular here, this downflow below the continent, an analog to an ancient subduction zone. Those are about a 100-kilometer scale. If you do the average of the entire potential temperature, you see no thermal anomalies at the scale of the continent itself, and I want to separate those two out clearly. We have a thermally linked network theory that predicts that potential temperature, and the entire potential temperature does depend on the continent. It's just not localized. If we were to cut off, or if the Earth somehow could cut off that mixing, we would not have this efficient communication of the subdomains. We developed a non-linked thermal network theory to actually address that. There's some specific predictions here. We have the potential for two regimes with transitions. Through the regime, the globally average mantle temperature, that is the potential temperature, if you like, remains constant. And the prediction there is that the potential temperature below the oceanic domain will be decreasing. That's going to lead some predictions from the oceans, which will hopefully extend our ability to test some of these ideas. So let's look at the transition in a numerical simulation world. Here's the initial well-mixed state. We have wraparound conditions on the side, efficient communication between anything going on below the continent on the ocean side, one potential temperature for the mantle. There's a supercontinent here, no thermal anomaly below it. If we 
induce subduction along the edges of the continents to form a subduction curtain, we notice over time we have a change in the average potential temperature of the ocean. It's dropping. The potential temperature below this continent is rising. Notice this anomaly now is not on the scale of plumes. This is not related to plumes at all. It's on the scale of the continent itself. The thing will tell you it's not related to plumes at all is the average temperature of the oceanic mantle is decreasing. There are plumes there. In fact, the CMB heat flux out of this is greater than on this side. Uh, the average temperatures add up to be the same throughout. So that was kind of the test. This is the two states and the transitions between them. In particular, if this happened, if we then had a state where those subduction curtains collapsed or the supercontinent began to spread, we would have a pretty unusual situation in terms of a transient driving force on mantle convection, a continental warm front, oceanic cool front. If we think about convection in our atmosphere, we think about this all the time, in terms of thinking about this in a Stokes flow, which is the mantle, we rarely, if ever, think about it. That's good, um, because that means if it happened, it should have left a noticeable signature, and that's what we're going to actually look at. In terms of getting a little bit more intuition about this, um, it seems so interesting to us. We weren't satisfied with pencil and paper theory, numerical simulations. We actually wanted to do, if at all possible, a real-world experiment, and we did. This is a laboratory tank experiment. You're looking through the side of a tank with corn syrup, which has a high temperature dependence of viscosity. There's an insulating continental lid in place that actually sets up a temperature gradient, which drives a downflow along the edge, which isolates these two regimes. There's a thermal sensor below our analog to the oceanic mantle, a thermal sensor below our analog from the supercontinent side here. There's the thermal probe data, and there's a basal temperature as well. The continent is rapidly removed, um, a modeling way to do drift. We see the collapse of these two thermal domains, a gravity current, cold gravity current being driven below here, warm gravity current being driven below here. There's multiple phases. There's the initial breakup. You see the CMB heat flux is increasing a lot, or analog to the CMB heat flux. We actually go through a period of uh, pseudo-stability. Hot stuff over cold stuff is stable, and there's a lull in convection. Plumes are formed, they rise up to the surface. Um, for those of you who don't enjoy the theory world, let's move into some specific predictions of uh, what this might say about the Earth. If we had this happen and we went from a time when the subduction curtain formed and we had a change now in terms of the temperatures, it's the oceanic side I want to focus in on. If the potential temperature of the oceanic domain is dropping, that means its viscosity is increasing, strong temperature dependence of viscosity for mantle rocks, which would predict that the overturn rate of oceanic plates would be decreasing, which in turn, and we can model this, would actually predict that the rate of degassing from mid-oceanic ridges would be changing, which as a volcanic flux of CO2 into the atmosphere could affect climate. We had a look at this with some climate modeling. Uh, this is suboceanic mantle temperatures, subduction in mid-oceanic uh, ridge melting predicted by the scaling theory and the models. Here is the predicted change in surface temperature, or if you like, partial pressure of CO2. We are tracking the partial pressure of CO2. That's affecting uh, the greenhouse properties of the atmosphere. We're also modeling the drawdown of CO2 through weathering reactions. Now, if you're interested in some of the details of the climate modeling, Mark Jelinek will give a talk in this session about it. So again, be patient. Um, conservatively, we can get about a two degree drop in climate associated with the formation of the supercontinent and the mantle going from a well-mixed domain to a thermally isolated domain. If we look at the transitions in the other direction, continental breakup or collapse of the slab curtain, that's interesting as well. We are actually now unleashing a large lateral temperature variation, which is associated with pressure gradients, which will drive flow. This will be a distinctly transient pulse, but it will be associated with a large rise in surface heat flux as the overturn rate of the mantle increases. Here is the results from some of the model predictions about that in terms of the average, well, look to the right, the pointer's not working. In terms of the fluctuations themselves, you can see there's a pulse 
I've also put on a best linear fit onto that. Now, that's not because I am necessarily a fan of that. I wanted to actually compare it to another modeling study. Um, this was work led by Thorsten Becker, which also tried to calculate the changes in oceanic heat flow since Pangaea breakup using plate reconstructions. Now, in our models and our theory, we don't prescribe the velocity of plates. It, it's self-determined. Um, there is some consistency between the two groups, and that's good, different perspectives coming to similar ideas. So we should have this pulse of increased um, heat loss. The mantle is a sticky place, if you don't know it. Um, what that means is information is transferred pretty quick. The pulse is actually felt along the CMB as well. In the middle, you're looking at the predicted changes in the core mantle boundary heat flux. You'll see the time when the supercontinent breaks up. We have different times of duration, how long the supercontinent is assembled. And that will set up the temperature variation, the transient pulse. So there will be that initial condition, if you like, dependence in the predictions. But for those particular models, if we look at Pangaea breakup, both from the lab work and from the numerical simulations, we see a pulse of CMB heat flux, plumes are generated. If we actually then calculate the rise time from the plumes to the surface, it puts the pulse where the lips are. Also, there is a low heat flow from the core around the time of the supercron, which might be consistent. In terms of that pressure gradient, what it's going to do for continental arcs it's going to actually favor continents overriding subduction zones. That is, it's going to put margins into compression. Or another way to phrase this, it's actually going to favor continental arc volcanism as opposed to oceanic island arc volcanism. Colleague Sinti Lee has actually mapped that pulse, and we're continuing to do that. That's on the left. On the right, um, this is showing you why this could be very interesting for climate issues. Uh, carbonates sit on continental margins. If you actually put the margins into compression, favor continental arc volcanism, you're actually going to drive a source of CO2 loss that's metamorphic, um, also on top of what's coming from the mid-ocean ridges, a little take-home cartoon. Is that a big deal? Um, potentially, it's a very big deal. We can look at a modern example. Mount Etna is one of those. It actually accounts for about 20% of uh, the global flux. The continents actually show that they're going into compression from the modeling side. If we actually put now all of this together um, and actually ask what that would do for climate, we have these forcings, the volcanic forcing there from the isolated state breaking up, the subduction curtains collapsing, if you like. There's a mid-oceanic ridge source, that arc metamorphic source, large igneous province source. If we feed that into the climate model, now looking at supercontinental assembly, we have the drop in temperature, breakup, we have the big pulse, we have the OIBs coming in. And although not perfectly, um, we can model the transition from ice house to greenhouse world. Given the amount of words you've already seen, I'm going to give you all my conclusions visually. There it is. Thanks for listening. We have time for a few questions. Maybe one, one or two questions. Uh, over there. The, the prediction and topography signal is potentially up to 200 meters. I've been hesitant in comparing that to sea level curves from observations, because every time I do, I get yelled at in that people have strong disagreements about the observations for sea level changes. The model itself, um, a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred, uh, one, <laughs> uh, 100 degrees in terms of thermal isostasy, we're predicting 100 meter um, sea level fluctuations. Any other question? In the back. Yeah, um, if you recall, I'm not going to take the slides back, um, but the predictions from the oceanic heat flow, there is a pulse. Um, the main pulse goes through about 50 million years. There is a little bit of the transient in the signal still predicted today, but we're close to going back to what I would call a reference state, and the reference state we had to define by the well-mixed 
state as well. That, that's somewhat consistent with the Becker arguments as well. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Our next talk is a, an invited talk uh, by Nicolas Coltis. And the title, what is that? The title of Nicolas talk is Seafloor Dynamics in Mantle Convection Models. Thank you for uh, this, invi this invitation. So I have something in common with uh, Dory. I have very bad memory. Uh, yeah, I really do, my friend knows that. Uh, when it comes to seafloor spreading, uh, the, the memory I have access to is just 200 million years. Not more than that, and it's very little compared to the age of the Earth. It's like you, you will remember uh, 20 seconds of my talk. Uh, so is it enough for us to, uh, to use these 200 million years to uh, extrapolate the, the fluctuations we, we know of seafloor spreading over a longer time scale? To try to have some um, ideas about that, uh, I will try to show you that with mantle convection models, we, uh, we have access to longer time scales, and maybe we can give some, uh, some, uh, so, some answers to the question I just asked. So the, the, this, uh, this talk, this work has been done in collaboration with uh, Tobias Rolf and Paul Tackley from Zurich, and Maria Seton and Dietmar Muller from uh, the University of Sydney. So this is our tape recorder. This is our memory. It's the distribution of, of uh, seafloor edges today. And uh, with that information we have here, we can uh, estimate the heat flow coming out of the Earth. We can estimate uh, sea level, knowing the, the ocean volume. And we can also estimate tectonic, uh, tectonic stresses. So this is a, a very fundamental observation. When you combine this, this observation to uh, a fantastic uh, theory, which is uh, plate tectonics, and uh, with uh, some geological observations. What you can do is that you can extend your memory, go back in time. You can go back, uh, for instance here, to uh, 120 million years. And uh, this is a reconstruction of seafloor edges uh, at a time where the, 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 the South Atlantic is starting to, to open. You can even go further back in time. This is kind of the limit. Uh, there are, there are uncertainties on this, but you can re reconstruct uh, seafloor edges dis distribution 250 million years ago. But this is really our limit. And this is what plate tectonics can, can do. Plate tectonics can, can go beyond that because we don't have any more information on the seafloor. So to, to go beyond that, uh, we need to, to solve a force balance. We need, to, we, we need a dynamic model to have a, to information of our uh, longer time scales. So wh what I'm going to show right now are uh, dynamic models in which you have sort of uh, seafloor spreading and continental drift. These models have been developed by Tobias Wolf and Paul Tacle over the past two years. These are convection models, dynamic models, so I won't show you the interior, but what you see here is the surface. And what is very peculiar to, to this model is that you have in there um, a rheology which is uh, pseudoplastic. Uh, that means that uh, at the surface, the, the, the material is really resisting. It's kind of stiff. Uh, however, when uh, the, the stress exceeds a yield stress, then the, the viscosity, the, the strength of the material just drops uh, depending on the, um, on the strain rate. And then you can localize the formation in quite narrow zone. What you have in these models as well are a sort of simple model of continental lithosphere. So if I can manage to use that. Yeah. So what you see here is the viscosity at the surface of such a model. When it's red, it's very stiff. So in these models, the continents are in red. They are the, the stiffest parts at the surface of, of that model. When it comes to uh, green, it's kind of stiff as well. It's not rigid, but it's almost rigid. And when it gets to the blue, the viscosity is really low. It's low because 
these are zones where the yield stress uh, is exceeded. These are zones where we localize the deformations. So if, we, if I make a shortcut, okay, you have continents here, you have oceanic plates, and these are uh, plate boundaries. For instance, in this situation here, the ridges would be there. Uh, so these are the, the two panels of the, of, the same, uh, of the same snapshot of the simulations. And you can have also, you can see the downwellings, like it's not exactly subduction, of course, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not exactly the Earth. We, we still have a lot of uh, work for that, before that. But you can see downwellings here that are uh, located as elongated regions. So I let this uh, model evolve. And for instance here, you can see a sort of uh, plate-like behavior. Uh, those who are interested in plate tectonics, uh, you model the, 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 the plate motion on the sphere by rotations, and you see here a clear uh, rotation. The other pole would be uh, right there. So the, you see that, whoops, sorry about that. Maybe I can stop. I'm struggling, but I'm gonna make it work. All right, so in this model, you see the, the continents that are drifting. They are drifting quite slowly compared to the Earth. And you see the, the plate boundaries that are changing quite a lot over the, the course of this simulation. This simulation is at a, what we call a statistically steady state. So we start from a sort of equilibrium situation. We let the continent move, the plate boundaries that are changing, I mean, self-consistently. And we can make some statistics out of it. Contrarily to the, to the Earth, where we have 200 million years of uh, record, here we can run the simulation as long as we want to. So here you have a, a situation where the evolution is more than, uh, is, is about uh, three, billion, 3 billion years. So we can make some statistics over 3 billion years to try to see if the statistics uh, match the, the, the information we have on, on Earth and eventually uh, go beyond that. This is one snapshot of this simulation. And what, you, what is computed here uh, is the distribution of sort, sort of model edges of the seafloor. What you have in gray are the location of these uh, continents, model continents we, we have. And you have uh, here the, 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 the oceanic, uh, the, the seafloor edges that are scaled to, to the Earth. So what you see in, the, in this snapshot are elongated uh, ridge-like structures. And uh, the downwellings here in this model are around the continents mostly, and this one just extending a bit away from the continent. In, in that particular snapshot, you can see here the distribution of the ages, the, the, are, the, the area versus the age of the seafloor. Uh, with this kind of uh, distribution, you can compute the heat flow and things like that. What is very interesting is that it's decreasing as uh, the edge of the seafloor is increasing, which is what we uh, have on Earth. And what, it, what you see here is that you have much more young seafloor than old seafloor. It means that you are consuming quite uh, young seafloor. I mean, you can see here, for instance, you have sort of reach that is reaching the, the downwelling that is there. So you are, in a way, uh, consuming uh, young seafloor. Such distribution can be interpreted in different ways. First, continents impose uh, a, sp a specific geometry on the oce ocean uh, continent boundary. So here you have uh, three cases which are at steady state. Here you have a ridge, and if the continent ocean boundary where you have consumption of, uh, of seafloor is uh, parallel to the, to the ridge, then the, 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 the distribution will be sort of a square. If you change that geometry and have something like that, then the distribution will be triangular. You'll have higher rates of uh, production of new seafloor if you, if you keep the same age, because the, the integral of this uh, distribution is the total area of the seafloor. So you need to conserve all the time this integral. So if you switch to a such distribution, you increase uh, the rate of production of new seafloor. And if you change the, this bond, the, the geometry, again, you can have uh, all sorts of, uh, of, of distribution. If you want to know more, more about the geometrical effect, you can 
come by and see the poster on the Crystal Two Plate Station, the the Eye of Sorrow. Um, the another effect that can uh, change the the distribution is our fluctuation of the spreading rate. For instance, you start from this kind of distribution here. If there is an increase of the seafloor production rate, since you need to conserve the integral of this distribution, you have to consume some, uh, some seafloor. So by doing that, you, are, you can produce uh, a distribution that is uh, decreasing with age. So I'm going to look at, uh, at that in the models. So we computed uh, time series of the seafloor production rate that uh, basically is the, you know, the, the first value here. We have computed the uh, uh, time series of the seafloor production rate uh, in which, um, uh, I mean, there are three models here. A model without any continent, so you don't have the geometrical constraints here. And you have two models where you have the six continental rafts as the one you've seen before, but the red one is with a low yield stress, meaning that the, the lithosphere here is uh, yielding uh, easy, easily than the other one, which has a higher, higher yield stress. Okay? In this one, the lithosphere, in a way, is, uh, is stronger. What you see is that you have uh, quite a lot of fluctuations, and you have l very high peaks of uh, production uh, of seafloor, uh, especially with the, the one with the low yield stress. So uh, this is a nice histogram to show that. And what you have to see here is that when you have continents, you have uh, a higher production than uh, without continents, meaning that the, without continents, the distribution is flatter. But what is interesting here as well is that the, the, the strength of the lithosphere when it's uh, stronger, the fluctuations are smaller. We can compute period periodograms of this time series and try to see what are the, over which time scales you have variations. And uh, I'm just going to go really fast. What, it, what matters here is that you have peaks of uh, variations, of, I mean periods uh, of variations which really matter that are much longer than the 200 million years. So uh, we need uh, more information about the, 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 the seafloor spreading history than 200 million years to really know how seafloor spreading could have varied uh, over the, um, the history of the planet, or over a longer time scale than that we have. Thank you. Is there a question or two? So what I have to say here is that the, the continental drift we have uh, I mean, is not, is not perfect yet. <laughs> so we don't really have a very good assembly or dispersal because our models of the continents are very simple. Tobias has improved these models and we're going to have uh, results. But what we, what we tend to have is that when the continents are, are together, the distribution of the seafloor is flatter with a lower seafloor production rate. Any other question? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's proceed. Our next um, talk is a, an invited talk. It's given by Shiji Zhang. And the title of the talk is uh, A Model for Earth Mantle Dynamic History for the Last 500 MA and the Implications for com Continental Vertical Motions and Geomagnetism. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, today I'm going to talk about uh, the mantle uh, structure evolution for the last 500 million years. And first, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the important contribution from my uh, collaborators, uh, Peter Olson, and also my former student Nan Zhang. Um, so uh, actually, I'll start to show you the present-day Earth's mantle structure that, as we all know, that is really dominated by the so-called degree two of the spherical harmonic 
harmonic degree two structure, okay, for the uh, normal mantle. Um, so showing here the seismic uh, uh, tomography results uh, at the longer wavelengths uh, in the lower mantle. Um, so such degree two structure sometimes can all, it's also been called as a, uh, uh, you know, so African uh, and the Pacific super prunes. So basically, uh, what we so well, so basically, what you see here, it okay. Uh, so we have the seismically slow norm, uh, anomalies. The two of them actually being separated by the seismically fast anomalies, and the fast anomalies, of course, are dominated by the subducted slabs. Um, so there's two seismic slow anomalies sometimes actually got, uh, being called as African and Pacific superplumes. And so those, those are really basic characteristics of the degree two structure. Um, then those structures really exist uh, throughout the lower mantle, may actually even extend a bit of to the, uh, uh, into the upper mantle. Uh, in the geodynamic community, it's probably, it's probably fair to say it's a, it's a con sort of consensus view is that such a degree two structure is really a result of uh, uh, plane motion history. Um, and that is, if you have the subduction history that actually really controls the location of the, the down warnings uh, that organize, organize the flu field, as shown here by a calculation that uh, Alan McNamara and myself did a few years ago, uh, that actually used the plane motion history for the last 120 million years, really reproduce such a structure uh, fairly nicely, okay? And of course, one question we can ask ourselves is that what actually, what was the mantle structure in the past? Uh, that is, for example, since the Paleozoic. And this is an important question because we know that the mantle structure has a lot of implications uh, for the Earth's gravity field, uh, and the volcanism, and the seismicity, et cetera, okay? Um, so uh, for the last few years, of course, we have seen two uh, different proposals. Uh, one view is that the, uh, the same degree two structure as the present day uh, basically exists for the last 500 million years or maybe even longer based on the uh, you know, evidence uh, for volcanism. Um, and then the, another view is that the mantle structure uh, may actually be largely degree one during the pa uh, Paleozoic, and then degree two is a relatively you know, new fe uh, feature that is probably only exist for the last 200 million years. This is based on mostly on the history of the pa Pangaea assembly and break, and break up. And that is to say, we, uh, we know the Pangaea uh, you know, uh, basically assemb assembled about 330 million years ago uh, as a collision uh, between the, the Russia and the Gaola land. And so such Plane motion history, of course, actually would have, you know, influenced the mantle structure that was really the basis of this second view. So what I actually want to do, of course, is mostly focus on our own work that is actually to discuss this particular view, okay? Um, so to do that, we actually build a global, uh, you know, a sort of proxy global plane motion model for the last 500 million years. Um, for the last you know, 120 million years, um, we can actually use published models that actually somewhat based on the observations and this is uh, this the Lurley and the Richards model, and also Mueller's model. Um, then, before that, uh, before 120 million years ago, then for the African hemisphere, we have, a, a, you know, basically geologically constrained continental motion that I, we actually can use uh, to build the plane motion model. And then for the Pacific, of course, and we don't really have information there. We just assume that the plane motion is largely uh, that of uh, uh, up warning, uh, consistent with up warning or the uh, divergency flu. Okay, so this is kind of the model that play motion we build, uh, and so we can actually use this to drive the mantle convection in a similar way as uh, uh, McNamara and the zone did uh, in 2005. And just showing here, this is actually the average play motion versus the time. Um, you know, for the last 120 million years or 20, uh, 140 million years, there are actually two models showing up here. They basically all show quite a lot of variabilities with time, okay? Um, then, uh, of course, uh, you know, this is actually, you know, uh, the, the up and downs here also reflect the, the fact that you have the Pangea assembly and, uh, you know, and other things. Um, so first I want to just show you the, uh, I just want to show you some of the predictions that we have here. Um, this is actually, of course, is the seismic results that I showed you earlier um, at particular depths, and this is a you know, spectrum diagram for the depths versus the harmonics. And this is actually a model prediction for present day. And as you can see, um, they actually really, uh, these two pictures really, they're kind of similar to each other, and this is also, the same thing can be said for the spectrum. So the, uh, I guess what we can conclude here is that from our calculations, 
uh, you know, our model actually really uh, can reproduce the prison diaseismic structure reasonably well. Um, then, of course, if you take the same model, you look at the back in time, this is the present day, this is about uh, 190 million years ago, and this is uh, when the Pangea was formed. And basically, what you see here in the African hemisphere, uh, you know, back, back in that time, we, we didn't really have a, a super plume there. Rather, we have a largely down warning. And this is not a surprising because really, before the Pangea assembly, there is a tremendous, there is a significant amount of uh, uh, play convergence between the Laurasia and the Gangwalan. Uh, that convergence produced a lot of down warnings and cold material in this hemisphere, okay? So the short story here is that, and this calculation suggests that, uh, the mantle structure, uh, basically for the last 500 million years, is highly variable, probably changed from degree two, uh, degree one to degree two, uh, in the, uh, really in the last uh, 200 uh, some million years uh, ago, okay? Um, so with this model, of course, we can start to make some predictions. Uh, for example, we actually can, from the model, we can compute the seafloor age distribution, and this actually is a model prediction. It's very similar to, of course, observation. And we also can predict the heat flow. This is a model prediction, um, you know, and also bathymetry. Um, so high resolution models like this, you can really do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, can compute, can predict a lot of uh, observables. And we all know this is very, very similar to what we actually seen today. And uh, we can also compute the dynamic topography uh, as is showing here. And, you know, basically there are two dynamic topography highs, one above, uh, you know, Pacific, another sort of broadly above the African hemisphere. Um, so I just want to quickly uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, this dynamic topography history. And for example, this is actually about the 330 million years ago. This is predict the dynamic topography, and this is uh, where you know this is Russia, where the, uh, also where uh, the North America is. And then this is actually the temperature field at that time in the lower mantle. So as you can see, the Russia is a, the dynamic topography is you know is really low there and negative. Uh, meaning that there's a dynamic depression back in the, back at that time. Of course, not a surprising. There are a huge amount of uh, downwarning material, cold downwarning material below the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Russia at the time. And then if we look at about 100 million years later, and then the same uh, area, basically you see this, uh, see the, you know, uh, the dynamic topography is much less now. And, you know, this is reflected the temperature structure in the mantle, uh, in this area. So we can look at the, let's say if we take uh, one cratonic area, for example, slave craton, and we, then we just uh, uh, look at uh, how the dynamic topography there varies with the time, and so this dashed line shows the model prediction. Um, so you know, at about 330 million years ago, there's actually, uh, you know, our model predicts a very, very low dynamic topography there, then which that actually kind of increases with time. And the shaded area basically showing the, the geochemical study uh, you know, for this uh, unroof, unroofing and the barrier history for the slave craton. And so what you see here is really there, there are quite a bit of uh, similarities in, time, in, ter sort of in terms of time behavior, okay? So which, we suggest, you know, which suggests that our model prediction probably is uh, uh, reasonable. And uh, we can do the same kind of analysis for uh, the Kapov, uh, Kapov craton for in South Africa. And again, you show similar, we, can, we find a similar kind of good agreement between our model predicted dynamic program history and for and the observed ones, okay. And the next, then you know, I guess the next topic I want uh, touch on is actually uh, is to look at the, our model uh, implication for the Earth's magnetic, uh, you know, polarity reversals. So we know that the Earth's magnetic uh, uh, mag magnetic field actually they reverse the polarity frequently, and but there there are times where we call the super crumbs. When you know, then that's actually when. The Earth's magnetic field actually being very, very stable, the uh, polarity being very, very stable for tens of millions of years, such as the Cretaceous supercrumb and Cambrian supercrumb. And from geodynamic, uh, geo geodynamo studies, that we know that uh, the polarity reversal actually really may be controlled by the command boundary heat flux. And since in our model, we can actually predict the, predict the command boundary heat flux varies with the time. For example, this is actually the present day command boundary heat flux. There in the, and Africa and, and the Central Pacific, the command boundary heat flux is very, very small, and it's not surprising because there we have two super plumes, and they actually insulate the core, so reduce such to reduce the command boundary heat flux there. And then, but 330 million years ago, and the story is completely different. Back then, we have this degree one structure that is uh, in 
uh, in, you look at the temperature in the African hemisphere, the temperature is you know, relatively cold, and that actually really suck a lot of heat out of the core, so you have this largely degree one structure, okay? So we can actually take this kind of, we can actually make predictions like command boundary heat flux like this, and we then fit this into the dynamo simulation. And then my, you know, my collaborator, Peter Olsen, actually took this kind of results and run the dynamo simulations to look at the polarity reversals, okay? Um, so what you're showing, what we see here is actually, uh, you know, the different time period, and then this is the dynamo intensity um, um, versus, uh, uh, you know, the time, simulation time. And so what you see here is, uh, uh, according to uh, you know, our model, you take the, our model prediction, and what you actually see is that there are, uh, you know, from the dynamo simulations, you have this, uh, uh, you know, um, sort, of polar, sort of stable uh, polarity for long, long time. I guess I should have said this uh, shade, and, you know, this is gray and the white, you know, air, you know this bars actually really show the reversals, okay? Um, so, like, for example, uh, uh, you know, for this uh, uh, around 275 million years ago, there's basically from the model calculation shows no polarity reversal and also no polarity reversal about 480 million years ago. They're actually kind of consistent with observed uh, observations. But there's a problem, of course, that we have here is that uh, around about uh, 100 million years ago, the same model actually predicted quite some uh, you know, reversals that we actually know that back that time actually is a uh, Cretaceous supercrumb. So our model uh, kind of, you know, shows some interesting uh, results, but still it's not perfect. And we're still working on trying to understand what actually happened for the Cretaceous supercrumb. Um, Peter also did the calculations taking the, uh, the degree two um, structure, uh, degree two mantle structure model for the last 500 million years, use that as a command boundary heat flux to compute the, dime, uh, the reversal. Uh, then basically he, sh he found that you don't really get the uh, super crumbs with, you know, assuming a very, very stable degree two structure throughout the time, okay? So I guess I'll just stop here. And the very, very simple message that I would like to kind of um, kind of send here is that, uh, I guess, why is that we actually, you know, we can really build models like this, try to understand, try to ask questions about what the mental structure evolution for the last, of, you know, 500 million years. And the second message is that uh, such models can really uh, maybe you may be useful to kind of integrate uh, geologic history, uh, you know, together with volcanism and, and look at the Earth as a sort of dynamic uh, system. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, if there's a, a question, real quick. Yeah. Um, well, the degree two geode, uh, we all know it's actually it's very sensitive to the, uh, the radio viscosity structure. And so, um, I, I guess, uh, we haven't really looked at this in the world, looking into that right now. Um, but the short, I guess the short question is that that's, uh, somewhat a different problem. Yeah. But it's a very important one. Our uh, next talk is given by Mark Jelinek. Title is Supercontinental Cycles and the Tectonic Modulation of Earth's Climate. Which one is it? Is it the PowerPoint or the yeah, PDF? Yeah, the PowerPoint. PowerPoint, okay. That's just in case it blows. Okay. Okay, so we've got this. Yeah, there's the button. Right there. Oh, you got it. Okay. <laughs> Back up. You can advance with that or that. And it's going to go for 13 minutes and go yellow at all. Now for something uh, a little different. Um, so I'm going to pick up where Adrian actually left off a little bit. So Adrian showed that the formation and breakup of super supercontinents does sort of profoundly disruptive things to the mantle with some remarkable consequences. Uh, he focused on the magnetic consequences and the, and the, uh, the long-term sort of 100 million year greenhouse climate of the Cretaceous. So there's a couple of questions that emerge that we're looking at more broadly, which is, that's the Cretaceous signal. Is there a generic supercontinental uh, footprint on climate change in Earth history? And how do we find it? Um, why climate? Well, everyone's working on climate, right? Climate's cool. Um, not really. So climate, particularly if we go back in time, climate proxies and ocean chemistry proxies open up a lot of uh, potential observations that allow us to test our models relatively rigorously. Um, 
Now, the heart of any climate model, it's very simple. As long as you can, over long time scales, as long as you know what goes in and what comes out, no problem. Right? So CO2 goes in through volcanoes or metamorphism, as Adrian discussed. It comes out through silicate weathering and organic burial. Right? So as long as all those processes work the same way as we go back through history, it's an easy problem. Um, well, it's not that easy, it turns out. Uh, you know, the Earth has done at least one good thing for us, which has given us two experiments. So Pangea, Adrian talked about. <clears throat> and I've just shown sort of a summary of some of the observations he mentioned. So Pangea forms up here, we get a sea level fall. Uh, Pangea breaks up sometime later, 30 or 50 million years after the beginning of breakup, you get a light up of LIPs, and then this greenhouse period. The second well-posed experiment is Rodinia. Well-posed meaning there are actually observations for us to look at. Um, <clears throat> now, again, it's a climate model, so we just have to know the influxes and outfluxes of carbon. And so, uh, how do they work, right? How do they work back then? So, <clears throat> I'm actually going to start in the top right. Um, so this is a, a cartoon ocean from Nick Butterfield, looking at the uh, recent ocean, so Cretaceous up till now ocean on the top, and what he thinks is a reasonable Proterozoic ocean on the bottom. So the current ocean is full of oxygen, full of life. Um, a good thing here is that organic burial that, or organic matter that dies in the shallow ocean or the deep ocean can actually fall through the ocean and land on the bottom. It can actually take carbon out of the system. Um, I'll talk about that more quantitatively in a bit. Uh, back in the Neoproterozoic, especially, uh, it's a low oxygen world. If we come back over here, the red curve is, is oxygen level. Uh, it's a one so the, the upper bound on the oxygen level at that time is about 1% of now. And a consequence of that is the ocean has very low oxygen. Uh, the bottom of the ocean is probably anoxic, stratified. Uh, the bottom picture just shows biology. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this other than point out that we go from a microbial world to a metazoan world through the end of the, the sort of Rodinian supercontinental cycle. The thing here is that all these guys are really small. They have a habit of, they have not a lot of buoyancy when they die. And so they can't actually sink through the anoxic part of the ocean. Right? So already the climate problem starts to become interesting. And looking at observations back up to here, <clears throat> there are two that are interesting. So one is the banded iron formation. So can we produce a, a long-term period of very little oxygen in the ocean that allow us to make them? And then the obvious one is snowball earth. So the question <clears throat> that's sort of a, a non-trivial one and not resolved, I promise, <laughs> in this talk anyway, is can the same physics that gives rise to a greenhouse effect that lasts a long time in the Cretaceous can that same physics give rise to global glaciations at the end of the Neoproterozoic? Right? Same forcing. So a couple things that go in uh, to the problem, worried about influxes and outfluxes of CO2. So the mantle model, our mantle convection ideas, set basically what the thermal regime in the mantle is. And that determines what the outgassing is, what the metamorphic input is, et cetera. Weathering and organic carbon burial depend on a lot of things. Tectonic regime, for example. Um, are there shelves for organic material to fall onto? Weathering regime, how does it work? What's being weathered? How rainy is it? How wet is it? Um, et cetera. Um, the good thing is that we can actually constrain a lot of these things in the current ocean and uh, use at least models and proxies to get information in the paleo ocean. So how do we do this? What's the tool? Well, we begin with a mass balance. Um, so this is total carbon in the ocean atmosphere system. This is where all the fluxes in. And this is all the fluxes out. Um, normally what's done in these models is this uh, <coughs> decay coefficient or rate constant, K effective, which handles all the organic and inorganic burial is left constant. It's about a million years, because that's kind of what it is now. It turns out that's not true. It's not a very good assumption that this guy and the flux vary over comparable orders of magnitude. Um, so it already becomes kind of an interesting problem. How does weathering work? Just very briefly. Um, so flux in from the mantle, weathering, <coughs> uh, silicate weathering. I'll start with first and then talk a little bit about organic burial. In an island arc dominated world where there's not a lot of mountain building, um, the chemical weathering rate, which is W, is a very strong function of temperature. It depends on rainfall and whatever the background erosion rate is. What's being weathered matter matters, with granite or basalt. And the interesting thing has been sort of pointed out in, in uh, some work by Cliff Reby in particular, 
is that the effective activation energy for weathering, the Arrhenius constant in this problem, um, <clears throat> in the current world is probably a third of what it was in the past. And that's to do with what biology does. Our biology helps break down rocks. In terms of a climate model, what that does is reduce the temperature dependence of the weathering feedback. So it becomes kind of it becomes neat in, a, in the long-term model sense. If we go into Adrian's uh, breakup world, where continents overrun their subduction zones, um, Kellen Whipple um, and uh, uh, David Mead have shown that there's, you can actually find a similarity solution between the mechanical and thus chemical erosion rate and a subduction rate. I'll talk about that more um, in a bit. Organic burial. Well, in the modern ocean, this is what I would call as an offensively tunable parameter. Um, whatever you need to do uh, to solve your, to, to close the carbon budget, you can often deal with, with organic burial. In the Proterozoic Ocean, life gets actually simpler, which is unusual in Earth problems. Um, little guys, the little dead guys, can't actually sink very well. So first, what are these things? So <clears throat> burial rate is B. Is B primer, uh, P dot is a primary production rate. How, uh, how much do we make? Oxygen, shelf area. This is ocean stratification and particle buoyancy. Um, the main thing is primary production depends on weathering, delivery of phosphate. In the Proterozoic Ocean, um, all of the, uh, basically the shelf area is, is really the key. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, over very long time scales, we can look at variations in, in PCO2, and they really just scale with um, the, the ratio of the flux in over whatever it is the effective uh, rate constant squared. And uh, I'm just going to use that. Okay, some review of Adrian's talk in about four seconds. So he'd identified three mantle flow regimes, a basic, a basic state, extensive thermal mixing, and one potential temperature. A perturbation that lasts for about 150 million years. We put a supercontinent on and unmix the mantle. And then a transient breakup um, in pictures. Uh, mantle temperature here, subduction velocity over there, time on the bottom. Basic state, we begin at one, we end at, the <coughs> end at one. Uh, with the same potential temperature. At a supercontinent, the ocean side temperature drops a lot. As we go through the transient, as that uh, uh, warm uh, subcontinental mantle rolls up over the top of the cold mantle, we evolve very quickly from a very cold ocean mantle to a very warm one, and then uh, sort of back towards where we, are, where we are at the moment. Okay, some predictions. So. <clears throat> In this world, uh, weathering for one is, is it's probably in, mostly an island arc world, but weathering for one is fairly independent to subduction rate. It's low rainfall, high shelf area, so organic burial is, is uh, slightly enhanced. Through the transient, um, continental arcs are probably the, the, the bigger player because continents are overrunning the subduction zones. Uh, simulations of supercontinents show you get very, very high rainfall. Um, more mountain building, but <clears throat> and you get a weathering rate that actually depends a bit on the subduction rate. Uh, the volcanic transitions, Adrian talked a bit about this. So the high temperatures that the, the oceanic mantle feels through this transient produces a, a bunch of different fluxes, and Adrian showed this plot. The only difference here is the Rodinian and, and Pangean arc fluxes are different. So in this case, the Pangean flux includes a bigger carbonate contribution uh, than the Rodinian one. We've tuned this one to, to satisfy um, <clears throat> the uh, observations from Cinti Lee's uh, recent paper. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter too much. But what you see here, anyway, is that <clears throat> uh, volcanic fluxes drop. They go up through the transient. Uh, large igneous province volcanism happens 30 to 50 million years later, after the arrival of mantle plumes. Um, there's another prediction that I'm only going to touch on very briefly, because um, it, uh, it's one of these things where it was a great story until last Friday and then died a cold, horrible death when someone did a real experiment, um, <clears throat> which is that at the height of uh, formation, where the oceanic mantle is at its coldest, um, actually basalt crustal production becomes very low. It can actually go to zero. And in that case, the seawater interacts with mantle rocks, and the serpentinization reaction produces a very large flux of methane. In the Cretaceous Ocean, Nothing comes out. Deepwater Horizon did the experiment for us. Most of it's oxidized or eaten. In the Proterozoic Ocean, a lot of it may get out. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> well, the results are not necessarily intuitive. And I'll come back, I'll come back to that probably next year. <laughs> uh, but it can warm or cool the planet. Okay, I'm going to skip seawater chemistry. Just look a little bit at climate. 
So Adrian showed this plot. Uh, the main thing is that the Rodinian and uh, Pangean worlds act slightly differently. But during supercontinental formation, we have a cold world, go through a transient, we end up in a warmer world. There's a long period uh, of greenhouse effect. Um, some consequences of climate change in the cold world, reduced silicate weathering, less primary productivity, um, can reduce organic burial. For, uh, to go through the transient into the continent, continent, continent uh, arc world, enhance silicate weathering, more pro primary productivity, and so on. Um, we get predictions for things we can test, like anoxia in the, uh, during the Cretaceous world. Um, and one of the questions is, do we get noxia in Rodinia? Right? Do we actually have enough, put enough biology in the system um, to uh, produce a situation where um, banded iron formation is possible? Um, Okay, one question on this. The simulation I just showed you, the, the model calculation, gave a warm world at the end. Is it always warmer? Uh, the answer is no. One of the driving questions is, can we ever end up in a snowball? The model I just showed you, <coughs> we left weathering to be dependent on subduction. And it turns out that subduction does not enhance weathering. It actually can reduce its efficiency. And so what you see here is that if we remove the dependence of subduction, so we go from a continent arc world back to an island arc world, we actually end up with a slightly colder world because the LIPs have put more basalt up there. If we increase organic burial to uh, sort of regimes where um, some of the geochemists working on this, just Dan Schrag would be happy, the world drops a few degrees still. So about minus five degrees at an upper bound um, at the end. Okay, so we've done two experiments, um, Pangea and Rodinia, and the question has really been, you know, is there a climatic, a sort of a, a generic climate fingerprint of supercontinents? Um, a couple things I've talked about, a couple things I blew off. So um, on the Cretaceous side, the greenhouse, LIP volcanism, sea, variations in sea level and ocean anoxia been a focus. The same model actually predicts the, strong, the seawater strontium curve and the seawater magnesium calcium curve with reason, reasonably well. Going to the Neoproterozoic, uh, the same anoxia that we sort of expect during Pangaea is consistent with uh, banded iron formation. And then the question I'll leave you with really is this, which is, you know, can we make 50 million year long snowballs at the end? Um, not with the current model. We can make it cold, but not really cold. Uh, and the only way out of this problem at the moment with what we know is to turn up organic burial. And I'm, I don't know why that would happen. Um, so some progress, uh, but I'll leave it there. Okay, we have time for one quick question. No. Uh, the, the problem, with, so the, the key problem with Snowball Earth is if the, if the oceanographers, ocean chemists are right, right, that there's a stratified ocean in which the biology at that time cannot sink. That's at a time when sea level is high, so there's just not a lot of shelf area around. So, you still get black, but the question is the volume, right? Eventually, but the question is whether you get enough volume. Uh, yeah. Critter buoyancy is the problem. Okay, so the last talk of this uh, first part of our session is uh, by John Crowley. Mantle convection with strong plates and the tectonic mode of a terrestrial planet. Okay, this will go yellow at 11 and red at 13. All right, thanks. The work I'll be talking about today is work I've been doing with Rick O'Connell and more recently Adrian Lenardic. An interesting problem in planetary dynamics is trying to determine whether or not we'd expect a planet to have plate tectonics. Uh, recently there's been a lot of debate over whether or not so-called super-Earths would have plate tectonics. These are planets that are assumed to have Earth-like parameters but are much larger than the Earth. Now, whether or not you actually care about super-Earths 
Um, it's actually an important debate because it draws attention to the fact that we don't all agree on how plate tectonics works. So here are a few studies from the past um, five years. The debate really started with papers by Valencia and O'Neill and Lenardic. Valencia said in response to the question, would we expect plate tectonics on super Earth? She said definitely. O'Neill and Lenardic did some numerical simula simulations and said no way. And a series of studies followed in which people, uh, Kite et al. said probably not. Uh, Cornaga said maybe. Stein et al. said it would be less likely than, uh, than on the Earth. Van Heck and Tackley said more likely. And Foley and Berkovici said maybe. What I'll try and convince you of is that the answer is more likely both yes and no, and that this isn't the same as maybe. So what I'll be talking about is a new analytic boundary layer model that we've developed for mantle convection with strong plates. The model reduces to the classic parameterized scaling when plates are weak and produces new analytic solutions for sluggish lid convection when the plates are strong. Um, the model demonstrates that multiple solutions are sometimes possible with each solution corresponding to a distinct mode of thermal convection. We'll do some uh, simulation with some numerical simulations. We'll talk about a little bit about the idea of history dependence in the system. And finally, we'll talk about some of the implications for planetary evolution. Now, in order for a plate to be subducted, energy needs to be provided to bend and deform that plate. The energy can be provided by the potential energy of an attached slab, by tractions on the base of the plate, by a mantle pressure gradient, or by the uh, variations in density in the plate, which results in a, a local uh, rate of change of potential energy. Now, these forces aren't all independent of each other. Many of them are coupled together through the flow uh, beneath the plate and in the mantle. So our approach to solving the problem is to use energy balance equations to determine this coupling. So we start by simply uh, writing out the momentum equation. We multiply by velocity. We integrate this over a volume. And this gives us a mechanical energy balance for whatever volume we choose. We do this for two different volumes. The first volume is the entire system. This includes both the lithosphere uh, and the mantle. And this energy balance just tells us that the total rate of change potential energy in the system from density anomalies moving through the gravitational field must be balanced by the total dissipation and the sum of dissipation from bending the plate and viscous dissipation in the mantle. The second energy balance is an energy balance specifically for the lithosphere uh, and shown with the dashed red line. And this energy balance tells us that dissipation in the plate has to be balanced by work done on the plate by um, the mantle pressure gradient, tractions on the base of the plate, uh, slab pull, and the local rate of change of potential energy, again, sometimes referred to as ridge push. Without going into the details, we have an approximate solution for the flow beneath the plate as a function of the plate velocity and the stress on the base of the plate. We can then evaluate all the different terms in the energy balance equations uh, as a function of the plate velocity or the, and the stress on the base of the plate. And we then have two unknowns, two energy balance equations, which we solve together. And this gives us the plate velocity and the flow beneath the plate. Now, the first interesting result from the model is that we sometimes get multiple solutions. And what this means is if we were to calculate something like the plate velocity as a function of some model parameter, this might be the mantle Rayleigh number, it might be the strength of the plate, sometimes we find that the model predicts a single solution, and sometimes we find that there are regions of parameter space for which we get multiple solutions. So let's look at a few examples. Here is the calculation of the plate velocity as a function of the mantle Rayleigh number. For small mantle Rayleigh numbers, we find that the model predicts a single solution, which is this upper branch. Uh, that scales with the Rayleigh number to two-thirds. However, for larger Rayleigh numbers, we find two new branches of solutions. To get an idea of what's going on with these different solutions, we can look at the horizontal velocity in the convective cell as a function of depth. So if we consider the flow for a point on this upper branch, that's this point one, we just have a simple cellular flow in which the plate velocity at the surface is comparable to the flow at the base of the convective cell. However, these two new solution branches have plates at the surface that move slower than the flow beneath them and therefore give us sluggish lid solutions. As another example, here's the plate velocity as a function of the strength of the plate, so we're varying the effective lithospheric viscosity. For weak plates, we find the model gives us a single solution. For strong plates, though, we find that we start getting multiple solutions and this new solution branch down there. So again, we've got three different solution branches here. And we're going to refer to these as the fast, intermediate, and slow solution branches because they have very different plate velocities. 
And it's also just important to point out that these different solution branches don't span the entire parameter space. So this upper branch of solutions exists only for weaker plates, the lower one for stronger plates, and the intermediate solution branch for intermediate plate strengths. To get some kind of an idea of what's going on here, we can look at the energy balance for the lithosphere. If we first consider the upper branch of solutions, uh, the plates in these solutions are moving very quickly. That means they have little time to cool, and the plates are very thin when they're uh, bent and subducted. Because they're thin, the dissipation term and the ridge push terms are both very small in this energy balance, and all we're left with are the terms which couple the plate to the mantle below. If we set those two small terms to zero and solve this energy balance, we just recover the classic scaling that tells you that the plate velocity scales with the Rayleigh number of the two-thirds. So solutions for this branch depend only on the properties of the mantle. For solutions on the intermediate branch, we now have plates that are moving a little slower. Because of this, they have more time to cool, they're a little bit thicker, and these two terms are now comparable in size to the terms uh, which couple the plate to the mantle, and there's actually various balances here that can give you that intermediate branch. These solutions depend on both the properties of the mantle and the plate. Finally, the uh, lowest branch of solutions, which has the slowest moving plates, has very thick plates, the dissipation in the plate and the ridge push terms are extremely large, um, and we end up with a balance which gives us solutions that depend only on the properties of the plate. So you may be wondering now if we see any evidence of this in numerical simulations. Well, we do. So we're now going to look at some numerical simulations that Adrian Lenardic did. We've got thermal convection in a simple fluid layer. Uh, it's heated from below, it's cooled from above, uh, and the color here is just showing you temperature. For stresses below the yield stress, the viscosity is de determined by a temperature-dependent relation. At the yield stress, the rheology switches over to a plastic branch in which the effective viscosity is then equal to the yield stress divided by the strain rate. And the yield stress is parameterized using a simple depth dependence in here where tau zero and tau one are constant and z is the depth in the fluid layer. So the temperature dependence gives us a cold, strong boundary layer at the surface and the plastic rheology allows for local zones of failure that gives us plate-like behavior. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at changing the plate strength by changing this tau one parameter or the depth dependent yield stress and we're going to change the total temperature dependent visco viscosity variation by changing this parameter theta. And what we're going to do is we're going to run the numerical simulation um, and see what kind of convective solution we get. Do we get an active lid solution in which the surface of the, the convective cell is mobile and participates in convection? Or do we get solutions in which the surface locks up and is either stagnant or sluggish? Sometimes we'll also find that we get episodic solutions, but we're not actually going to talk about those too much here. So here are the results from about 300 numerical simulations where we're varying the strength of the plate and the total viscosity variation. You'll notice for each viscosity contrast, there's two rows of solutions. So let me explain what's happening there. For the bottom row of solutions, we start with a weak plate, we run the simulation to steady state, and we then ask uh, what state we have. We then increase the strength of the plate a little bit using the previous simulation as an initial condition, run it to steady state again, increase the strength, run it to steady state. By doing this, we stay in this active lid regime of plate tectonics all the way out to here. Then it switches over to this sluggish and stagnant lid reg uh, regime. Uh, the upper branch is calculated in the same way, except we start with a really strong plate and slowly lower, uh, sorry, slowly decrease the strength um, and we find that we're able to stay in this stagnant lid regime all the way out to here. So we've, we're getting this region of parameter space for which multiple solutions are possible and the state that you're in depends on the initial condition you started with. So there's a history dependence in the system. I showed this plot earlier. This was the plate velocity calculated using the energy balance model as a function of the strength of the plate. And this is exactly the type of behavior we would expect given a solution structure like this. If you start with a weak plate, you have to start up on this solution branch because it's the only one that's possible. As you increase the strength of the plate, you can traverse along the solution branch, but at some point, you have to transition down to this lower branch. And the same thing is true if you're starting with a strong pl plate and decreasing the strength. So we can now do a comparison between the results of the numerical simulations um, and that predicted by the analytic model. 
To do that, we need some way of estimating what the effective strength of the plate would be. To do that, we calculate the thickness of the plate just using the half-space cooling model, and we then evaluate the maximum yield stress at the depth of the maximum thickness in the plate. We can then put that into the analytic model, and we find that we get basically all the same features as are coming out of the numerical solutions. So for weak plates, we just have the one active lid solution. For strong plates, we've got stagnant lid solutions. Um, and for intermediate strengths, we've got this region of multiple solutions, which grows in parameter space as we increase the viscosity variation. So we can summarize all of this in this conceptual bifurcation diagram, which shows on this axis the viscosity contrast, uh, which is really the same as the convective vigor. Um, for weak viscosity contrast or weak convective vigor, we have a single solution that doesn't really depend on the initial condition. But as we move up to uh, systems that have larger convective vigor, we start to see this multiple solutions. If we were to put different sizes of planets on here, small planets would, small, would fall at the small convective vigor end, with large planets being out here. We certainly expect super-Earths to be down here. And this means that the solution we get is probably going to depend a lot on either the initial conditions, if it's a numerical simulation, or the initial assumptions if it's uh, an analytic model of some kind. So this may explain why there's such a large disagreement over whether or not people expect super-Earths to have plate tectonics or not. It also may provide an explanation for why similarly sized planets like the Earth, Venus, and Mars um, seem to have very different states. So in conclusion, to determine the tectonic regime of a planet, it's not enough just to know the parameters. It's not enough just to know the size, the temperature, the viscosity. We also need to know, um, given those parameters, whether or not to expect multiple solutions. And if we do have multiple solutions, then it means we need to know something about the history of the planet, otherwise we can't predict its state. Thanks. OK, we have time for a question or two. Uh, I have one. Um, for uh, super Earths, I guess uh, a lot of people in the planetary formation community might think that the initial condition would be a hot condition yeah. uh, from the heat of, heat of gravitational attraction. So how would that affect uh, your statement that you might have, have both? It seems like maybe you would be able you would, you would hit that plate tectonics one first. Is that right? Um, well, if you're, if you're starting really hot, then mm -hmm. you're probably starting at this high convective vigor point right. at which you've got multiple possible solutions. Um, so I think you would okay. actually need to know a little bit more about what else is going on, what's going on with the climate. Um, what, what you, something, okay. I think you need to know more about what you're starting with you know, before you can say whether or not. Okay, and would you expect a change in the tectonics as you as the planet eventually cools? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a slide, but I, I'm out of time. So. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll, oh, and we did have a question back there, and we have a time. We have a chance for it. Um, there is a dependence on aspect ratio, but we Adrian played around with different aspect ratios. Um, and this kind of multiple solutions you get uh, is a robust, it seems to be a robust feature even if you're changing the aspect ratio. Um, it maybe just shifts the, the parameter space in which you expect to find those multiple solutions. But yeah, we, we played around with that a bit. <laughs> okay, um, I'd encourage you not to go too far because we have another uh, set of speakers coming up at four o'clock. Thanks a lot for coming.